Hey everybody, hope, hope you're doing well today. Welcome to, to a webinar put together by Element 451. Today we're going to talk about five ways student-centered enrollment makes admissions easier. So if you're not here for this webinar, of course, you can sit around and listen to us. But welcome. My name is Artis Kadu. I'm the founder and CEO of Element 451. With me today is going to be Eric Range. Eric is going to drive our presentation. He's our product manager here at Element and leads a lot of the product product development. With me today also is, is Brendan, Brendan Henkel. And Brendan is one of our success engineers and support engineers. And he's actually going to collaborate with me to show you a few of the examples during the second half of the webinar. One of the things that we at Element and overall are, are seeing every day is a huge transition in terms of how our students are interacting with us, how our, our partners are interacting with the students and this experience that's being very quickly moved to digital. And as part of that, we, as a product company, we do a lot of, a lot of learn a lot of teaching and we do a lot of basically framing of this new interactions and a new way of thinking about how how these are how this new way is important so that's what we're going to try to do today we're going to go over what is student-centered enrollment we're going to very quickly have some example of have five ways that it makes admissions easier and we'll get have some time towards the end for any questions. This webinar is not meant to be a very content heavy webinar or a demo of anything in particular or specific. However, it will give you a lot of material and a lot of food for thought and a lot of real world examples on, oh, that makes sense. And how you can then go back and take a look at some of your processes and think about it. It's non-product specific. However, the examples that we're showing here today are going to be very element specific in terms of how the implementation of that is done. All right. So before I actually jump into this, I want, we'll go over a few other of the examples, but as a consumer, my consumer behavior has completely changed over the last decade plus. I consider myself very digital savvy, a first adopter on, on everything. It, it becomes very natural for me to adopt any new technology. So obviously one of the great examples that I use in terms of that was online banking. I've been doing that now for a really long time. I moved states. My, my bank was Citibank up in New York, but they don't have any branches here in, in the Northern Carolinas. But I have not changed my bank yet because everything is done through my mobile device. So I don't know when the last time you guys went and deposited a check at the bank. It's probably been a really long time. Same thing with electronic stores. And when was the last time you actually bought, gone and bought some kind of an appliance or a vacuum or anything like that. So if you're thinking about today buying a new car, I don't know, where would you start? Would you just go to the dealer and then see what's available and say, maybe today you are because of the short inventory, but you're, you're, learn, you're learning about the new car, the new product starts online. Nobody leaves their couch and we're expecting everything to come to our door. It's the same thing for millennials. It's the same thing for, for every generation that we're used to that. And that's been accelerated over and over again. And again, if you're like me, most of the big and small things in your life are done digitally now. But however, there are a lot of holdouts, right? There are a lot of holdouts and that experience has not, that digital experience has not been transformed a lot of different services or a lot of different workflows that you're dealing with. So for those of you, I don't know, how many of you have been to a dentist or a doctor lately? The same thing goes for, anyway, so you've been going there for a really long time. It's the same, it's the same process. They make you fill the same form, especially if you're moving or if you're going to a new state as I did, making fill that same exact forms, these paper forms, and of course, clipboards nonetheless. And then when you actually see the doctor, they're holding this really nice tablet and you're thinking to yourself, it's like, I just filled out this paper. I just probably just went in the garbage, right? In the trash bin. So every single time that happens. So why can't we get it together? Why can't they get it together? And it's the same thing for many students. The experience of getting into college is very similar, right? So they see this very slick social ads. 
that we work with marketing agencies or our marketing teams put together and then stone age paper forms on the next thing when they're trying to, to work with the office or we're trying to work with some of the other workflows that have not done digitally. So there is a lot of friction. So repeating the same information over and over, they're being asked to do all the same thing over and over again. It feels, feels like the, uh, you're being stuffed from one waiting area to another. And, and that's the same thing for our students. Now, we like to talk about this word friction quite a bit, and I'll just get into this slide in just a second. But as we think about those examples that I just presented, there is friction on every one of them. And what friction is essentially, what are the steps to take me from point A to point B to do something? And as user experience designers, we think a lot about how can we make that easier? How can we make that faster? How can we make that experience easier? How can we reduce the time to accomplish a task? And how can we make that enjoyable uh, for that end user. So that is removing removing a step that we need to do, making it easier to provide information, to collect information. Time is very important. So reducing that time that it takes to do something becomes super, super important. Our friend that now going to uh, and giving real world examples and hearing it from the mouths of actual students and potential students, our friends at Enrollify, professional development hub for higher education. If you're not familiar, you should go and follow a lot of their content. But they went on a roadshow sponsored by Element to talk to college students about everything from applying to college to the future of higher education. And some of what they heard is really important to us in higher ed is the taken. And it hits you, right? It's, it really hits you because it becomes, you've been doing all these things over and over at the same way you've been doing them. But then when you're hearing it from that feedback, you're like, that makes total sense. It's like, why aren't we, we thinking about it that way? Well, here's a couple of them, right? So what are they saying? We pulled just a couple that, that kind of resonated with us. But if I can't find what I'm looking for in five seconds, I'm out. So it becomes super important for us to make information findable, to make it searchable, to basically provide relevant information rather than stuffing. And search becomes really important. So how is that mechanism that they're getting to your site and how are, they, how are you keeping them interested? So if they can't find what they need, they're out of there. They're going to go to the next competitor or they're going to go to a different school that perhaps has a better content strategy or content experience and they're able to find what they need there. The second one is if your website looks like it was built 10 years ago, how am I supposed to trust that your program is actually relevant? Now, and again, we think about this and we, we forget that it's not about just providing information, but it's also about the brand and the trust that we project towards our, our potential students and, and how we engage with them. So if they can't see that you're competent or you're able to project the brand that you're talking about in your text, on your emails or your social ads, then they they assume that the rest of the experience is going to be broken as well. So that's what we mean by friction. When we talk about friction is that if, that, if, they, if the first few steps of the experience are not very relevant, then it becomes really hard for them to see how the rest of them can be very relevant. The last one, it's, it encompasses everything that we've been talking about or everything that I've been talking about, the friction and the broken kind of siloed experience. And this one really hits home because it sums it up really nicely in, in their own word. I'm, I DM a school on Insta asking for program information. I was told to email someone from admissions. I did it. And then they sent me to a faculty member. It took over a week to get my question answered. The system is broken. So this ties it all together. I can't find information. I was connecting on a social channel, which is instantaneous, which is very two-way communication. I was told to go to a different channel, very different experience. They took too long. I didn't get the content that I wanted. And... Hence, the system is broken. We could, this can be any of us, right? It can be any school. It's not talking about specific, we're talking about specific school, but it can, you can see how this can be any school. And our job as kind of experienced designers, as people who are trying to manage that student through, we want to do a really good job at, at removing the, those friction points as, as fast as we can, as, as easy as we can. Now that I've said the problem and why do we need to do this and what the problem is, We'll go over five, Brendan will go over, we'll, we'll take a look at a, a five different examples that we've gathered on student-centered experiences that 
our partner schools are, are, are showcasing right now and they have adopted. So five different examples that revolve around specific areas to, to see how we've removed friction or how our partner schools have removed some friction in there in these particular areas. So I'll hand it off to Brendan and then Brendan will take you through this few examples. Awesome. Thanks, Artis. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. As Artis was saying, having a student-driven approach that's removing that friction to, down to everything you ask potential students to interact with, you make the entire process easier and maybe even enjoyable as we see with some of, these, some of these examples. So first up, we have forms. Forms can be a tricky beast to tame sometimes. If you have too little in them or too much in them, then you're not going to get what you need, or you've not, you're not going to get a response from the student. We have a couple of creative ideas here to help you utilize forms in a way that will, or is going to help you and the student. So the first example we see here is going to be with follow-up forms. Using a follow-up form is going to allow you to increase your form conversion rates while still collecting as much information as possible. Studies have shown that the more fields you include on a form, the lower the conversion rate. This is where follow-up in forms comes in handy. A follow, sorry, this is where follow-up forms come in handy. They allow you to present a very simple and easy way to complete a form and then offer a follow-up form to get more information, but not until the student has already submitted that first form. So you can see in the example there, you ask for the email, the first name, the last name, and then you submit that through and you collect that information for the student. You pull that into Element and then a follow-up form comes up after that, getting more information. It allows you to collect that additional information that you may need. Another great way to see how you can deploy forms in a way that's easy for the student is through our live chat. Um, so go in, start a new chat with uh, the live chat. The student messages in. They would like to get some more information on your program. And then immediately what pops up after that is going to be for lack of better words, a form that they're filling out for you to collect their information. So they'll enter in their email address, they'll enter in their name, and then once they enter that information and you're moving that friction of hacking to actually go in and fill out a form by including in the chat, you now have that information to now go in and have that user profile to go through and continue in your conversation with them, maybe build out a campaign to have that automatic communication going out and more, honestly. So we'll go into some more of those in a little bit. But the next thing I want to talk about, number two, is emails. So with emails that you want to engage with, of course, this is our example of emails that you probably don't want to engage with. So no one's reading anything word for word any, anywhere anymore. For decades, user experience research has shown that most people just scan online. And if we're being honest, scanning is okay and completely acceptable at this point. These examples right here, they're actually from our friends over at Enrollify. They aren't even getting scanned. They're, if we're being honest with each other, all of these will probably be looked at and then immediately deleted because no one's taken the time to go through and look at those. Zach over in Enrollify also mentioned a pretty revolutionary quote for me, and I think something that we can all take in mind here to look at what the challenge is ahead of us. He said, we are not in the market for eyeball time. We are, comp we are competing with the entire inbox, not just emails from our competitor schools. So we've got to start taking that seriously, but how do we start taking that seriously? And with any problem, there's a solution there ahead of us. And here's just a couple of ways um, that you can make your emails better. So Get rid of those big walls of text. Think big images, scannable headlines, clear call to action buttons, and I think most importantly, personalization. One of our partner schools, SEMO, has taken the approach of building out one email communication and use, utilizing our version conditions within Element to tailor these communications to be personalized, engaging, and have a clear call to action. And I think it's a great example of being able to let students know that not only are they seen, but they have a person to go to. They're putting a face to that connection. Super important whenever you're building out these email campaigns. But along the same lines of personalization, personalized video is another great way to show students that you care and that they matter. So taking a look here at an example of an email that we have, the first on the left, you're going to see an email. It's more traditional, probably what you've grown to expect with long emails, maybe informational emails that we probably even ourselves, if we're speaking, wouldn't give the time of day to. And next to it, you have 
uh, this personalized email with a short message and video or and it's honestly it's regarding the exact same information that's on the left side but it's being presented in a completely different medium it's being presented with the video and i was actually as we were preparing for this webinar i was speaking with eric who's running the show here and he has a if you don't know, Eric does have a degree in film. And so he was sitting there and he was telling me, he said, if you were a film director, you'd probably look at something like this and you'd probably be losing your mind. There's the lack of lighting and visual enhancements. It, it's not a professionally made video, but that's what makes it special. So you look at this video and you see something that's authentic. You see something that's personalized with the whiteboard, with the name on it. And the student now, they see this video and they feel seen. And it's a different impact than a super polished marketing video would have, which there's certainly a time and place for still. But this is different. This right here, you're showing the student that they are seen, that they are valued, and the numbers certainly don't lie with that. So our friends over at CoVideo, who's partnered with Fisher College, one of the schools, one of our partner schools, they gave us some stats here and they were saying that 95% of a message is remembered when in video versus just 10% when in plain text. And 70% of students are likely to stay on campus if someone at the school knows their name and has a personal connection. And both of those things are wildly important when you talk about connecting and engaging with students. Um, so definitely something to keep in mind here. But while we're on the topic of content, let's take a look at our third item, which is content about things I care about. So our friends over at RIT, they've been hard at work at developing content and messaging that the student will care about. And they've been doing that in a couple of different ways. So they've taken event registration to the next level and setting up an automatic trigger that sends out a personalized confirmation email and reminders that keep the student engaged. So you can see there, they go in, the student signs up for those events, that event, and they will then simultaneously after that's done, the email is triggered to go out to that student confirming it, letting them know that they look forward to seeing them, giving them that information so they can reference that as they go through. And again, setting this up, it's it's an easy win for your team, right? You're going in, it's minimal setup. As you can see here, you go in, you toggle on these communications, you build out the messaging right within the events module, and there's no coding involved, anything like that. So you're keeping the student engaged and showing that their actions matter and you care about their attendance and you have, and your staff is taking on little manual effort to be able to get that done. So I think it's just important here to remember that every touch point that we have with these students is an opportunity to better understand prospects and tailor additional content to them. So keeping that in mind with the content that we're putting out, I think is super important. So we've nailed down the content that, that, that makes sense. So now we want to go into timing that makes sense. And um, we want to be delivering the right message to the students at the right time and not based off of time or time delays, but driven by the actions of the student. So we're not saying that at April 1st, everyone gets a message. We're saying that this student took a very specific action, visiting financial aid landing page at least two times in a week. So that tells us a little bit about what's on their mind. So we sent a follow-up communication that maybe drives them to the landing page pertaining to scholarship applications or information. Then we give them another opportunity to inform us of what their thought process is through a survey. All of these things exist natively within Element. So anything, everything from setting up that segmentation for visiting that URL, building out the workflow that automates the sending of the communication to adding that additional step and even building out the survey. So all of that native within Element. So it really makes it super easy to get that timing down exactly right for the student. And here's just one more great example of that timing with one of our partners with RIT. They have where you showcasing the journey for the student. So the student visits these pages. And then once they visit those pages, those emails are triggered that's related directly with what page they were going to. And that's what the student will see. They'll be on the page, then they'll get the email. And you can see those Emails have those big images, they're personalized, short messaging. So great messaging there from one of our partners. So great example there. And that brings us to our fifth and final point, which is actionable calls to action. And whether it's in an email or on a web page, 
I don't know if you've experienced it. I have, but that learn more button is a gateway into an internet rabbit hole. You are focused on something. You're like, Hey, I want to apply, learn more about how to apply. Boom. And then it takes you to a page learning about something else. And it's not taking you directly to the application or you're ready to pay your deposit. And you go in there and you click on the link and it takes you to another page. It's detailing stuff and you can't actually go and pay your deposit. You can't just put learn more button on there. So when was the last time you went from point A to point B from a learn more button, right? Probably never. You get lost. And especially in today's world, you get sidetracked. You have to drive students to directly what you want them to do. So that is, so going in here. So instead you want to tailor your calls to action to where the student is in the funnel. So if they've been accepted, make the button as clear as day by clicking it, they'll be able to pay their deposit and send them immediately to a page where they can actually submit the payment. No lengthy instructions or an in-between page. Right then and there, they should be able to put in their credit card details and complete the task. You can see we have our partners that are going from the learn more button and adding in attendant admissions event. It's taking them directly to the events page. You have them clicking apply today and it's taking them directly into the application portal through Magic Link. So you want to drive students to the action that you're showing them. You don't want to give them the fishing rod with the you know, cheese at the end of it and they keep chasing it and you keep pulling it away. Give them the cheese. It's okay to give them the cheese. So I think we can all agree that we want to have, we want students to have an easier time getting into school. And these examples that we've given are just a start at how you might going to improve that experience for them. And we think it's important to know that all of these examples that we've given you help your team too. We're not just, yes, we're thinking about Obviously, it's the student-centered experience, but we think about the end user as well. We're thinking about you. We're thinking about quality of life. So we want you to become less reactive and more proactive by creating these automation items for things that you once did manually. And the possibilities grow when you start using that automation. You can't track those behaviors and have those communications driven manually. It's some of the things that we're talking about are just absolutely impossible to do in a manual fashion. Once you do that, you become less reactive, more proactive, you become more efficient and you become happier. The students become happier. You start getting those students in and they start more applying. You have more students coming in, more students are applying. When the information is clear and it's actionable, it means your team can get more done with fewer obstacles and stress. So that's, that is all I've got. For you today as far as those five points. We do want to open it up for questions from everyone. Feel free to throw those in and Eric will lob those to me and artists and we'll get those answered for you. Yeah. So feel free to use the Q&A function and we'll go ahead and answer any questions you might have. We've had a couple of people ask if the slide deck will be available after the webinar. And yes, we will have a recording and we will also share the, the deck as well. If there are any other questions at this point, feel free to use the Q&A function there. We've got... We've got a question, which is, what is a magic link? <laughs> a magic link is really a, they're called many different things, but it's a link that allows you to log in to, to a website without actually putting in a username and password. We used to call them pearls or personalized URLs in, in the past lives, but we call them magic links right now because it allows you to log in there without a, without a, a username and password. It, it re, again, removing that friction, they can just click on that link and then logging in. Right. right now, we don't have any other questions. We do have another minute. So if you do have a question, get it in. Yep. One, given that we have a minute, I wanted to give one six example here. It's from our friends at CMO. And as many of you has, have probably done, one of the things that, you know, one of the things that they, that we've done over the pandemic is eliminate test scores and make everything test optional. But a lot of those test scores were driving a lot of processes around scholarships and a lot of processes around financial aid and so on and so forth. So our friends at CMO were able to, by removing tests, by making it test optional and by providing and taking unofficial transcripts in allowed them to provide students with a admission and scholarship information within 48 hours of that student submitting that application. So that time went from 28 days to 48 hours. So that is a huge difference. And they saw that as very successful. And one of the lessons learned from there was, was that 
they had very little retractions of those offers or that admissions once they got the official letters. It was actually non, non-existent, so to speak. So a lot of us are thinking the process is the way it is because of a particular, because it works and that's the way we've always done it. But if you think about it from the student side, if you remove those frictions, it becomes a lot easier for them to apply. And then you can get to them a lot faster. It creates this great experience. For those of you who who are not familiar, the best example of this, which is not in higher education and software, is the Amazon one pay, one click buying experience, right? They have, as user experience designers, there's a lot of technology that goes behind that. However, from somebody thinking about it and saying, okay, we have to make it one click, then all the things that need to happen, technology helping with that, but that is patented. That process of one click is patented, so nobody else can use it. And Amazon is the large retailer and an online experience company today. So if you think about it, it's if it's working for Amazon and they're driving to removing more and more steps, it becomes really easy for that end user to buy more and grow. So it actually converts to business results. It converts to more better engagement, better conversions, happier students, just like Brendan was saying in those last three slides. I just wanted to throw that in there because I'm very fascinated by, and it's something that's a big drive of ours is removing those friction and having that better experience for the end user. Yeah. And we had one last question about the use of SMS instead of emails. And yes, while we didn't showcase any of that in our examples, all of the things that we showcased where we send an email could have very easily been an SMS. And I would say, and both diversify your channels and including SMS and text messages are a great way to do that. Absolutely. And I think that's all the time we've got today. Thanks for everyone for taking the time out. I know we're a couple of minutes over here, but hopefully you found this helpful. And thanks to Artis and Brendan for for sharing their thoughts today.